Salivary glands. The salivary glands play an important role in our body by the virtue of its ability to secrete saliva. Saliva has a role to play in maintaining the health of the oral cavity and for carrying out physiological functions like mastication, taste, perception, speech, etc. As this is a vast topic, so we shall cover it in parts. In this first part, we'll just take a look at the general structure and histological aspect of salivary glands. Salivary glands are classified as exocrine glands. It means glands with a duct system to transport secretions from the gland. Salivary glands are tubulo acina glands, which indicates the presence of a branched duct system and secretory units with both tubular and acina portions. Based on the method of secretory production, salivary glands are mirocrine glands. The term mirocrine is derived from the Greek word miros meaning part and crino meaning to separate, which literally translates to partially secreting. However, this is not completely correct. The secretions of the salivary glands are secreted through a process of fusion of membranous secretory vesicles termed as granules with the apical plasma membrane and this process is known as exocytosis. Salivary glands are broadly divided into major and minor salivary glands. The major salivary glands produce about 0.5 to 0.75 ml of saliva on a daily basis. So there are three main types of major salivary gland. These are present in pairs and these are the parotid, the submandibular which was formerly known as submaxillary and the sublingual glands. Parotid gland is the largest major salivary gland. It is purely serous in nature in adults whereas in newborns it is predominantly serous. Submandibular glands are intermediate sized major salivary glands and they are predominantly serous. Sublingual glands are the smallest of the three major salivary glands and it is predominantly mucus producing. The minor salivary glands are located in the submucosa of different parts of the oral cavity which, which include the lingual salivary glands which are termed as von Ebner's gland, labial, buccal and palatine glands. Among the minor salivary glands, the lingual salivary glands, that is, that is the ward Ebner's gland, are the only one which are serous. The palatine and the buccal glands are mucus producing, whereas the rest of the glands, that is the labial glands, these produced mixed secretions of saliva. The parotid submandibular and sublingual salivary glands contribute to 90% of total saliva secretions while minor salivary glands contribute to the remaining 10%. Looking at the anatomical aspect, the parotid gland is located subcutaneously below and in front of the ear in the space between the remus of the mandible and the styloid process of the temporal bone. The submandibular gland is located under the floor of the mouth in the submandibular triangle of the neck. And the sublingual gland is located in the floor of the mouth anterior to the submandibular gland. The salivary glands secrete saliva into the oral cavity through ducts. The different ducts of the salivary glands are Stenson's duct, which is a duct corresponding to the parotid gland. It extends from the lateral surface of the gland anteriorly, then moves across the masseter muscle and pierces the buccal fat of pad and the buccinator muscle and opens into the oral cavity in a papilla opposite the crown of the second maxillary molar tooth. The submandibular gland is located medial to and under the partial cover of the mandible. The duct of the submandibular gland that is Wharton's duct, it extends anteriorly in the floor of the mouth and opens in the oral cavity at the sublingual papilla which is present at the side of the frenulum of the tongue. The sublingual gland is located beneath the mucous membrane of the floor of the mouth. The main excretory duct of the sublingual gland that is Bartholin's duct may join the submandibular duct that is Wharton's duct and open into the oral cavity with a separate lingual sublingual papilla. There are also numerous small sublingual ducts known as ducts of Rhymenus which may join the submandibular duct or open separately into the floor of the mouth. 
So now let's take a closer look at the internal structure of the salivary glands. The acida structure of the salivary gland is analogous to the arrangement of grapes on a wine. The grapes represent acini, each composed of about 5 to 7 acinar cells. The secretion of the acinar cells is released into the duct system, which is here represented by wine. The wine extends from the acini to the oral cavity, where the salivary secretions are released into the oral cavity as saliva to aid in digestion. The connective tissue of the gland, capsule and septa surrounds and divides the gland into separate lobules. So a cyanide drain into the intercalated duct, which then leads to the striated duct. Intralobar ducts are present in between the lobes. And finally, it enters the excreted duct and drains into the oral cavity. There are also myopithelial cells present around the acini, which help in squeezing the secretion out of the acinus following neural stimulation. So let's now focus more closely. The acinus is a blind sac composed of secretory cells. The term acinus means berry or grape in Latin, which refers to the secretory unit of the salivary glands. The acini or salivary glands contain serous cells. Serous cells produce serous secretion, which is high in protein, whereas mucous cells produce mucous secretion, which is high in mucin, or it can produce mixed secretions. Intralobar ducts are of two types, intercalated ducts and striated ducts, which are also termed as secretory ducts. The intercalated duct cells contain a few secretory granules, some rough endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and a round or oval centrally placed nucleus. Then in case of a striated duct, the term striated refers to the light microscopic appearance of the basal cytoplasm that has well developed striations perpendicular to the base of the cells. So this appearance results from the infoldings of the basal plasma membrane that produce cytoplasmic rows containing numerous mitochondria. Hence it is termed as striated ducts. So looking at the ultra structure, the mucous acinar cells are elongated structures featuring peripheral compressed nuclei at the basal region due to high mucus production within the cytoplasm. The nucleus of mucus cell is oval or flattened in the shape located just above the basal plasma membrane and the rough endoplasmic reticulum is limited to a narrow band of cytoplasm along the base and lateral border of the cell. Golgi appear apparatus are dispersed in the same loci. The mucus cells contain numerous mucinogen granules and many of these granules coalesce to form large irregular masses that will ultimately discharge into the lumen of the acinar cells. The serous acini, apically the cytoplasm is filled by proteinaceous secretory that is zymogen granules which have high amylase activity. The serous acini are composed by triangular shaped cells and round nuclei component responsible for secreting a more aqueous secretion. The mucous acini produces thick viscous saliva which contains mucopolysaccharides and mucin, whereas serous acini produces thin watery secretion composed of cymogen granules which contains more proteins. Another feature constantly seen in histological appearance of salivary glands are the serous demilions. They are rather artifacts of the traditional fixation method. So in the first image you can see the relationship of the mucus and serous cells as observed in the electron microscope following rapid freezing method. So the serous cells extend from the basal lamina to the lumen of the acinus. And in the second image, the serous cells are shown to occupy the periphery of the acinus and this gives the appearance of the so-called serous demilion. This feature is visible in routine, routine preparations using immersion fixation. So the swollen mucous cells, they are forced out of the serous cells, leaving small remnants of the cytoplasm between the mucous cells, thus giving the appearance of serous demilions. But it is rather just an artifact. Another important feature of salivary glands are its contractile nature, which is represented by the myopithelial cells or the basket cells. These are contractile cells with numerous processes that embrace the basal aspect of the acinar secretory cells. 
They lie between the basal plasma membrane of the epithelial cells and the basal lamina of the epithelium. So in this image, the light blue cells are the myopithelial cells. Let's take an expanded look. The nucleus of the cell is often seen as a small round profile near the basement membrane. The contractile filaments stain with eosine and they are sometimes recognized as a thin eosinophilic band adjacent to the membrane, basement membrane. There is general correlation between the thickness of myopithelial cell processes and the viscosity of the circuitry product. So they are thickest like for example on mucus acini. So this is again a diagrammatic representation of the circuitry end pieces as we just discussed, serous and mucus. Serous produces more watery secretions and mucus produces a more mucinogenic secretion. The acinus then finally drain into the integrated duct and then the striated duct. So the integrated ducts are the first or the most distal element of the intralobular duct system. The intercalated ducts are lined by a low cuboidal epithelium. They drain the secretory end pieces, that is the acini. The striated ducts, also known as secretory or salivary ducts, they are the most specialized of the salivary ducts and they carry out most of the ionic transport functions that occur along the route of the saliva from the acinal lumen to the oral cavity. They are lined by tall columnar epithelial cells with a distinctly eosinophilic cytoplasm and, and spherical centrally or eccentrically placed nuclei. In relation to the ionic transport that occurs, sodium resorption and potassium secretion occur within these cells which are affected by changes in the levels of adrenal cortical steroid hormones, mainly aldosterone. Therefore, the striated ducts are similar functionally and histologically to cells of the renal distal tubule. The portions between the lobules join the larger ducts that then join the interlobar portions between that is present between the lobes and with the main excretory ducts which then empties into the oral cavity. As the excretory ducts become larger, the epithelium lining of these ducts changes from simple columnar to pseudostratified or stratified to columnar epithelium. At or near the entrance to the oral cavity, the main excretory ducts become lined with stratified squamous epithelium which becomes continuous with the buccal epithelium. This is a diagram comparing the components of the salivon, that is the circuitry unit of the salivary glands in the three major salivary glands, the parotid, submandible and sublingual. The four major parts of the salivon are the acinus, the integrated duct, striated duct and extruded duct. And the three columns on the right of the salivon compare the length of the different ducts in the three salivary glands. The red colored cells of the acinus represent serosecreting cells and the yellow colored cells represent mucosecreting cells. The ratio of serosecreting cells to mucosecreting cells is depicted in the acina of the various gland. So in parotid gland, intercalated ducts are long and narrow. Striated ducts are also long. Parotid gland have a 25% contribution to saliva. Submanual glands have shorter intercalated ducts as compared to parotid gland but uh, the striated ducts are consequently longer. Submandibular glands are responsible for producing about 60% of the total saliva produced by the major salivary glands. Sublingual glands have inconspicuous indicated duct as well as the striated ducts are also very small and it contributes to about 5% to the saliva produced by the major salivary glands. So this was about the general structure of the salivary glands and its histological perspective. In subsequent presentations, we shall discuss about the production of saliva and other aspects of the salivary glands. I hope you have liked this presentation. Please do like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.